Good afternoon, my name is Eric Wishart. I'm the Vice President of the FCC and a journalist at AFP News Agency. And welcome everybody. It's great to see us having a, a live event again. We're, we were checking, I think the last live event we had was when Matthew Marsh, the Fox Sports commentator, was talking about the Formula One season. So the Formula One started again on Sunday and we're back in business as well. So quite good timing. So um, I don't think the talk discussion today could be any more timely. It's about press freedom in the light of the new national security law. Uh, before I introduce the panelists, I would just like to say that our events are starting again. We've got a couple of flyers for very good events in the next, uh, going to be published today, I think, and tomorrow. I won't give, I won't give any details, but there's some good things coming up. Um, press freedom is still very much the pr priority of the Foreign Correspondents Club of Hong Kong, and we'll be unflinching in defending it. Um, on Thursday, I'm doing a Zoom call, because we're still doing Zoom events, with Maria Ressa from the Philippines, who you would all know, who got a six-year jail sentence uh, two or three weeks ago for cyber libel, a law that came into effect after the, the article that she didn't write was published. Um, but um, I know Maria, we see Maria quite a lot, but this is a bit different because we're going to be talking about what comes next. I'm also going to be asking her about how she sees this situation, so for once the roles are slightly reversed. And also we'll be speaking to a member of her defence team, Kyleen Gallagher, who is international defence team with uh, Amal Clooney. Uh, so it will be a different perspective and I'll be asking her, she's a very prominent human rights lawyer, she defended, um, she was involved in the Hillsborough um, family uh, case and also has taken up the case for the family of Daphne Galicia in Malta, so she's very high profile. And um, she has an Irish accent about as strong as my Glasgow accent, so we might need subtitles for that one. <laughs> So anyway, without any further delay, it's my pleasure to introduce the panel today. Um, Sharon Fast is a legal expert. She gave us great legal advice on how to cover the protests, and now she's, she's back. Uh, Sharon, you're a, you teach law at uh, the GMSC, the Hong Kong School of, University School of Journalism. Uh, beside her, it's a bit of a Hong Kong uni uh, kind of group at this end of the table. Uh, Keith Richburg, who's the head of the journalism school at Hong Kong University, but a very distinguished has a very has had a very distinguished career as a foreign correspondent with the Washington Post. Spent at least three years in China, and um, and also is, still works as writes as a columnist for international media. Um, Anthony Daparan, you just wrote a new book called City of Fire about the Hong Kong protests, and you're going to be coming back, I think, in a month or so to talk about your book, but for today you'll be talking about the, um, the new law. Um, Anthony is a, a, an author and also a, a lawyer, corporate lawyer, I'm told. Yeah. And the moderator today is our club president, Jody Schneider, who's senior international editor at, at Bloomberg. So I think we should, we've got lots of questions. There's been developments overnight and this morning, so lots to talk about. So Jody, thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so we'll just get right to this. We want to leave plenty of time for questions, of which there will be many, I'm sure. And um, uh, one thing I will say, this is being uh, streamed live, and we will upload it to um, YouTube later. So this will live on in infamy. We are uh, not under Chatham House rules. <laughs> uh, we are journalists, and we will speak the truth. Uh, so let's just get right to it. Um, the, this law obviously is so broad, uh, so all-encompassing, and has a number of sections. Uh, four of the articles, by my count, uh, that affect media and how the media operates in Hong Kong. Um, so I'd like to talk really about um, how things could change for the press in Hong Kong. Uh, Article 54 specifically calls for authorities to take ne necessary measures to strengthen the management of and services for news agencies of foreign countries, which obviously is um, obviously of concern to us sitting in a building called the Foreign Correspondents Club. 
And just this morning, in response to a question about the FCC's letter uh, seeking uh, guarantees for press freedom allowed under the basic law, Chief Executive Carrie Lamb said if the FCC and journalists can give her a 100% guarantee that they will not commit any offenses under the law, that she would do the same. So obviously that doesn't sound terribly reassuring about <laughs> press freedom. Um, so I'd like to start with, with kind of the obvious questions. What are likely the most immediate implications of this law that should we be looking for? And will media here be operating with constraints uh, more and more like those imposed uh, on journalists on the mainland? And I'd like to start with Sharon and ask her about what parts of the law she sees as most applicable to the media and how we should be thinking about this. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks. Thank you, Jody. Um, and thanks, everyone, for coming out today um, to, um, to hear us speak out on this very timely issue. Um, I want to start with a, a caveat that um, I am a legal scholar, and I am trained um, in Hong Kong. So um, my opinions and my views on the law are formed by my understanding of the common law and the basic law. And at present, I find myself quite, I suppose, uncomfortable giving advice or tips because conventional legal analysis is now maybe only 50% of the equation in Hong Kong. Because we understand from this new legislation that there are now perhaps two streams. That one stream of, of, um, of penalty or authority is now directly imposed by Beijing, and the other stream is, of course, um, in, in the very good hands of the Hong Kong judiciary. So, um, so that's something, the first thing that we should be aware of are, the, are now the creation of these two potential streams, and so the uncertainty that comes with that. That a Hong Kong lawyer now giving you advice or information about what is good practice and how to avoid penalties and, um, and, and stay on the safe side of this law will be giving you that advice based on conventional legal analysis of, of how a judge in Hong Kong would approach it. So, um, so there's a caveat that everyone should be aware of. Um, when we spoke yesterday, Jody, I mean, we started with, you know, yesterday, 24 hours seems a long time ago now that we've had these new implementation rules. I, I had joked with you that I shouldn't prepare too much because you never knew what was going to unfold, and of course, last night it unfolded. Um, I'll stay away from the new implementation rules for now. We will get there. When we spoke yesterday, my, my idea for a starting point would be, so what would a journalist look at initially when they looked at the national security law? They would probably control find, look for all references. Where does this law specifically mention media or news agencies? And then of course, you know, the, the secondary analysis comes when, when we see um, you know, application of you know, the enhanced powers of police and so on, but the preliminary starting point seemed like a good one, which was <coughs> the four articles. So what those look like um, is, is very, again, difficult um, to, um, to interpret from my, my common law training, right? This, the entire instrument to me has what I would call uh, a continental flavor. So um, it is very heavily influenced by the socialist legal system of mainland China, which makes it an uncomfortable zone for um, you know, very firm, strong, clear advice, I suppose. So this continental feel includes things like Article 9 and 10, which impose duties, right? So we have seen the very first mention of the media within this national security law is this duty to promote. W what is the duty to promote? Um, in, in common law systems, we often speak of a, a civil duty. You, know, you have a duty that you should obey the law and pay taxes, and those things are quite clear, but they have civil um, penalties, not criminal penalties. So the idea of that duty and what, how does one satisfy a duty to promote this type of law? Those types of questions are very, um, very awkward, I would say, and, and very uncertain in terms of clear prediction on what can we do to satisfy this particular duty, which doesn't really have any similarity in, uh, in Hong Kong jurisprudence as yet. And then, of course, um, we look to Article 41, which is one of the many provisions that waters down um, you know, the, the rights of fair trial and judicial independence uh, at saying that there will be no media permitted in the courts where 
the offense is deemed to be a state secret. So there's a very clear uh, exception made for free expression and free press there. There is no definition of state secret. That we don't know. And again, there could be two interpretations. There could be the interpretation of uh, the Hong Kong judges, and then there could be silence um, if this case is maneuvered into the criminal justice system of Beijing. And um, I guess finally, which probably is the article that brought a lot of people to this room, the Article 54, the ominous Article 54, um, which talks about strengthening and uh, you know uh, the management of uh, you know foreign media in Hong Kong. And so, what will that strengthening of management look like? What are the possibilities? Uh, earlier this morning, um, you know. We had a very public comment by the National Security um, Commission or Committee in Hong Kong uh, about additional powers that they were you know, giving to the police, and they were very public and elaborate with what those were. Um, all those, although those were very alarming and chilling details, there was a small hope um, from my perspective that maybe the media would be given you know, at least similar warning. But um, the, my, my latest understanding is that that information will no longer, that was a one-off, and that the, the details of those committee meetings will no longer be made public. Um, so we have those four initial articles, and I think um, that might be overly detailed. They may have said too much. Um, but um, we, we again have um, the possibility that many, many other articles within this national security law will have intersection and will be engaged um, in the exercise of continuing to try to report freely on the stories that arise out of um, surrounding the national security law. So I think it's a starting point, at least. Thank you, Sharon. It gives us, starts giving us a, a good way to start thinking about it. Um, Anthony, when, from your perspective, how do you think the law might be used in dealing with media? Yeah. And, and, you know, what, if, if you can, I know this is all, we're all just, you know, reading tea leaves here, but if you could kind of give us a way we might think about how this could be applied. Yeah, sure. I mean, firstly, I would uh, echo uh, Sharon's warning that this law is very much a, a creature of the mainland legal system. So at the moment, uh, no Hong Kong lawyer could definitively advise you on how to interpret it or how to employ, uh, apply it. Um, so for all those media organizations that have sort of head office calling you in Hong Kong and saying, can you get some legal advice? Um, there really is no legal advice a Hong Kong lawyer could give you. Um, although, to be frank, um, a, a mainland lawyer could probably tell you more about how to understand this law and how to apply it from a mainland perspective. So to the extent not wanting to sort of do business development work for mainland law firms in Hong Kong, but to the extent you find a mainland law firm in Hong Kong who have both Hong Kong and mainland lawyers who can look at this collectively, they might be able to give a more sensible view of what is essentially a, a, a black box at the moment. But as we get more court decisions that start to be decided here, and indeed we already have a, a court decision on the, on the presumption of bail from, from last week, um, we'll start to see the parameters sketched around the law and we'll begin to be able to advise on it and interpret it. But of course that can at any time be overruled by, by Beijing. So there's always constantly that idea that uh, if the courts here decide something not to Beijing's liking, then they will, they will intervene and reinterpret the law. But with all that said, um, I think there are so two two important things for, for members of the media to think about. Firstly, um, and probably most importantly or self-interestedly, are they at risk of breaking the law? So we all know that there are there are four, uh, four offenses, the secession, subversion, terrorism, and colluding with foreign forces. Um, uh, we know that they also cover incitement to do any of those things, so potentially providing a, a platform or reporting on someone who is themselves talking about secession or subversion may be understood to be incitement to subvert um, or, or incitement to secede. Um, the collusion with foreign forces offense, um, of course, applies initially to people in Hong Kong who are colluding with foreign governments, organizations, or individuals to commit a, a number of different offenses, including the wonderfully drafted causing the people of Hong Kong to hate the central government or the, or the mainland government. Um, but then as part of that offense, the, the foreign party involved also has liability under the law. So if you're a, a foreign media organization working or spe speaking to someone based in Hong Kong and you're seen to be under the law colluding with them to, for example, incite feelings of hatred among the Hong Kong population, you would have a liability under the, under the law too. Um, so there's certainly things that we need to be thought about. Um, 
the, the, the challenge is that uh, even if we sort of look at the law and take it at face value, you could listen to the assurances from Carrie Lam you know, a few weeks ago that, that freedom of expression would not be affected. Um, and read, I think it's Article 4 of the law itself that says freedom of expression and other freedoms will be upheld. But then literally the next day after the law came into force, we have the police with their wonderful new purple banner directly seeking to police pure speech acts, chanting of slogans, holding of banners. We saw numerous cases of people being arrest arrested apparently for pure acts of political speech. So when even the, this, this most fundamental point, will the law police speech or not, on the one hand the law says it won't, but on the other hand we're seeing them applying it directly to, a, to in, uh, attack acts of speech, um, it's really difficult to take at face value anything else that, that the law says. Uh, so that, that's one aspect. The other aspect is, of course, um, protection of your sources. Um, I think the law makes it much more important for members of the media to be careful about um, who you talk to and, and how you deal with them for the protection or for their protection um, and bearing in mind that they may be, may be at risk in, in talking to you. And in that regard, the new implementing rules that came out last night about access to information are very important because they provide the circumstances in which uh, the police can go to uh, the courts to obtain a warrant to require you to provide information, which will include, of course, any information you have of your dealings with sources, notes, contact information. They can uh, you know, search your devices or obtain a demand that you provide information. Uh, also, it provides that if you are aware that an investigation is going on or an investigation is likely to be going on and you destroy the information, that's also an offense. So you need to be very vigilant about how you record information, how you keep information, um, and you know, probably good practice to destroy information as soon as it's used rather than keep it and then finding yourself at a later date having to destroy it when an investigation is imminent or you're tipped off about an investigation and at that point destroying it will be, will be a, a criminal offense also. So that's just a, a few of the issues to bear in mind. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so Keith, um, I'm going to ask you a different kind of question uh, on the same theme, but you've worked as a foreign correspondent in a number of uh, Asian countries and, and as foreign editor at the Washington Post. Um, so how have you seen similar laws play out elsewhere in, in Asia? This, this is a little bit of we've seen this movie before in, in other places. Um, can you kind of give us a few examples and, and, um, and, and how you as, a, as an editor and, and a correspondent dealt with it? Yeah, thank you for that question. It's an important one, I think. You know, for a long time, Hong Kong was the place where you came to get a breath of fresh air and where you could report freely and you didn't need a visa to come in here and you could do anything you wanted to, and it was pretty open. I mean, I'd lived in Beijing for a few years reporting. I lived in Southeast Asia. And I always kind of came to Hong Kong and went, wow, what an open, free place. You can talk to anybody, you know, opposition leaders, everybody is around. I think, you know, this law, and again, with all the caveats, we don't know how they're going to implement it, but it, it, it seems to me that they're moving towards kind of where the rest of the countries in Asia are and possibly moving to where China is. And we don't know where in between that's going to be, where they're going to draw that line. We have to wait to see the implementation. But I was just jotting it down, you know, in Singapore, they suppress media and journalists using uh, the Internal Security Act. Uh, there's a subversion law, there's an Official Secrets Act, and uh, there's also a new cybercrime law, uh, law there. And Malaysia is pretty much the same. You know, they have a law against stirring up hatred among the races, among the ethnic groups in Malaysia. In Thailand, they very liberally use Les Majeste laws. So the biggest story in Thailand is the monarchy, but journalists can't really write about it. Um, or, or, you can, or you can find yourself in jail, a 15-year jail sentence. Uh, in, in Thailand, also, defamation is a criminal offense, not, not a civil offense. And so some of our friends, like Jonathan Head from the BBC, had this defamation charge hanging over him. And by the way, when you're charged with defamation in Thailand, they take your passport away. And so you can't travel. I think Jonathan Head was stuck in Thailand, couldn't travel from, I think, February until around uh, August or so. So the charges were eventually dismissed, but that really hangs over you like an anvil. Uh, Indonesia, uh, they have blasphemy laws. You know, so anytime you're writing about Islam or even quoting someone saying something that might be determined as blasphemy, you're liable. So uh, I say that to say all of these countries have some kind of strictures um, that you know that's like an anvil hanging over the heads of journalists. Uh, but the the point I'd like to make though is journalists still operate there. I mean, there's still there's still journalism being committed. So. I'm not the lawyer here on the group, but I usually I, I would have to just say I think journalists this this new law is our reality now. You know, it's not we can debate whether or not it was good or what happened, but it's the reality now. 
but I think the key thing is going to be whether journalists kind of curl up in a ball and say all is over, this is the end, or if they start trying to figure out, okay, how do we operate in this new reality? And and uh, and then I look and we don't really have a template for how this would work, but the only one we have is how it operates in China. Um, you know, in China, if you look at that as the template, it's it's pretty bad. You know, it's pretty you know it's pretty strict. I mean, if you look at the Reporters Without Border uh, annual index. I mean, it's, they, they look at 190 countries for their press freedom. China is always kind of in the bottom 10. But if you look, all the countries in Southeast Asia are in the bottom half. I think Hong Kong is about number 80, and that's since the protest and the attacks on journalists. Every other country in Southeast Asia, with maybe the exception of East Timor, uh, they're all down in the, you know, in the 90s and the 100s you know, for press freedom. So the press is not free in most of these places. But again, as I say, myself as a journalist operating there and my local journalist friends, they all figure out how to operate within the law. So the trick is, there's a couple of tricks to it. Um, and again, we have to figure this out because it's all new. But one is kind of figuring out where the red lines are and knowing where those red lines are, coming as close to them as you can, but without crossing those red lines. As I mentioned in Thailand, talking about the monarchy is kind of a red line. You know, but uh, when the late king, before the late king passed away and the current king was there, we found ways to write about the secession question without actually saying what the question was. <laughs> uh, you found ways around writing, so instead of writing directly about things, you figure out what is the way you should get around writing about this specific thing. And I would say that even when I was based in China. You know, I, had, I went to Taiwan a few times and had to write about Taiwan, but there were certain ways you had to phrase things and certain ways you had to tackle things not to incur the wrath of the government to come down on you, but also let the readers kind of know by reading between the lines what you're trying to say. The other things like Anthony mentioned is uh, I think journalists here in Hong Kong after the, you know, these, the good old years we enjoyed here have to be a lot more serious about protecting their sources, uh, protecting their information, protecting their data. You know, when I made, when I made interviews to go uh, talk to people in Beijing, we had a whole system set up where we would use burner phones and SIM cards. You make your appointment on a phone. You meet people in parking lots and walk around a lot more. They're just ways people learn how to operate. And, uh, in terms of, we don't know what this, uh, this mechanism is going to be to supervise or regulate uh, journalists. If, it's, if it operates the way it is in the mainland, I see potentially visa restrictions on journalists, which is again, something we never had to deal with here in Hong Kong. And the second thing I see potentially is we might get called in for tea. Yeah. And uh, whenever I was called in for tea, in the, or mo mostly my news assistants, by the way, because they, are, they get more pressure than we as the foreign correspondents do. I always was thinking that you know, as a foreign correspondent, the biggest threat to us is getting deported. The local uh, journalists have a probably, and again, we don't know, but I think they have a probably a larger chance of a trial and a jail sentence. I was trying to remember the last foreign journalist I remember who was actually jailed was probably Murray Hebert in Malaysia in 1997, was jailed for 30 days, and then they let him go and you know, put him on a plane back to Canada. But it's not, a, it's not a common occurrence in this part of the world to jail foreign journalists as much as it is to kind of you know, threaten them with all these kind of legal things and eventually deport them. So figuring out where the red lines are, uh, being more concerted about protecting your sources and your data, et cetera. And then th the third thing, which is in the law, it's very vague, but talks about, uh, well, the secret, open, op what's, what's a secret? We don't know what's going to be considered a secret document, et cetera. Several journalists I know in China have gotten in trouble for being in possession of so-called national security secrets or secret documents. In many of these cases, the document was given to them by someone, and then the next day you know the you know, security police knock on your door and they know exactly where to go to see the document and say, aha, you've got that document, you're out. So people have to be a lot more wary about uh, picking up documents or taking documents from people. When I was in Beijing, if I had, you know, we always had petitioners and others coming to our office trying to offer us stories. Every story was bigger than Watergate, you know, that sort of thing. I never let anybody in my office. I would always meet them outside because I was always wary that someone may come in and ask to use the bathroom and the next thing you know they put a secret document that I'm not supposed to have somewhere in my office and I didn't see it. So people have to just recognize this is a new reality I think and then we have to figure out ways to navigate around it. Good. Well thank you for that Keith. Um, so this next question is also in the realm of, of specifics. Um, we're hearing from a lot of journalists now who are saying, should they shut down their Twitter accounts? Should they be careful about what they say on WhatsApp, even if it's, it's supposed to be encrypted end to end? You know, should they go to Signal? But there's the question about self-censorship in all this. And frankly, this is something that, that we as a club are concerned about, that not only will there be, um, will people be 
you know, there might be ways in, in the law that we can be punished, but, but that perhaps part of the reason it is so vague and there's a lot of things we don't know in the way that it was, uh, that it came you know, about without anybody being able to read it until it was out, and even then, it, there's all kinds of questions, is being intended to be a self-censoring device. Um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that, and, and what do we, as journalists, um, and, and um, you know, as, as media, uh, media organizations, do about this, wanting to, you know, we have to operate under the law, and Keith talked a little bit about this, but, but at the same time, still do our jobs and not, um, you know, not, not let the law um, have us basically, um, you know, turn into the police ourselves and, and be policing what we write even before it's published. Um, Anthony, you wanted to start with that? Yeah, sure. I mean, obviously it's going to be a very personal decision for each individual and, and a, a policy decision for each organization. I think everyone has to think about what their own personal risk tolerance is. Um, I, I personally tend to err on the side of, of the, the, the very view that you're alluding to, Jody, which is that uh, you know, self-censoring too much is, you know, is giving in and, and giving them, in a way, a, a, an easy victory. Um, and until such time as it's made very clear through a, a court case or a, an interpretation of the law or something that authoritatively draws the red line and, 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 and says what's permissible and what's not, I would continue to, to, to speak and to publish and to tweet and to do whatever that we'd always done here. Um, and we've obviously had some arrests on Wednesday around certain speech acts. It'll be interesting to see if charges are pressed and if the courts agree that simply Possessing a flag with a with a slogan on it is enough to break the law, or possessing documents with 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 pro independence or anti government slogans is enough to break the law. And it will be interesting to see how they apply the 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 aspect of intent, whether possessing them with the aim or with the, or with what they regard as the intention to advocate that cause, as opposed to just reporting them and repeating them in the course of reporting or or, or commentating on them, is different. Um, but I think that people being overly cautious and self-censoring and this sort of wave of you know taking down social media accounts and all these sorts of things I, I feel is is does a does a bit of a disservice I think to, to, to Hong Kong and, and to the, the Hong Kong community and, and the, the culture of free expression here generally but I do recognize that everyone has their own assessment of the risks to themselves and, and, and the risks they're willing to bear so. Sharon what and what is your sense again you know with all the caveats you, you yourself just mentioned of whether um, the courts in Hong Kong are will be somewhat protective on this. Um, so, if, I mean, on the on the question of intent, um, to me, it's very clear um, that there is a subjective intent required for an offense um, in the view of Hong Kong judges on the matter of succession, sedition, um, treason. So. That subjective intent um, is somewhat reflected in in the the, the continental draft that we look at. Um, they they don't use the word intention. They say with a view to or a view towards. And a, a Hong Kong judge would interpret that terminology, a view to, meaning as an intention. So I think the caution is, you know, um, in, in terms of whether I have erased my social media, um, I will use the words of um, a prominent judge in Hong Kong um, when, when he um, was asked the question about whether he would feel political pressure to uh, make a different decision you know, um, uh, you know, based on his political views. Um, he, he said um, he was too old and too ugly. And I, I, feel, I feel like that's a very um, effective way to, um, I, I am somehow a public figure now with a very active Twitter account with very public views on what, um, what I think about the, you know, the impact of this law, the implications on free expression. So all of my views are very publicly known. And for me, um, the question of, you know, the luxury that I have is the question of whether to delete that is, I suppose, my, my, also my belief that this, that the small mercy of this law is that it is not retroactively imposed. And if we start to delete that history of our thought and our opinion and things that we said, things that we believed, then we're kind of, you know, achieving this erasure of the archive of history, of our, 
our views on uh, how we responded as a people to the challenges to free expression and, and other challenges that Hong Kong has faced over the past 10 months. So I don't want to give this law the power to be retroactive. Having said that, um, my concern is that um, if, you, if you look now at some of the early arrests that you've, Anthony has already mentioned, uh, and you see that someone in mere possession of um, you know, the offending slogan, liberate Hong Kong, revolution of our times, heretofore uh, re referred to as the offending slogan, um, mere possession of that flag you know, um, wouldn't be enough. But you have, you have um, Hong Kong government officials speculating that what the police could then do in, in the course of their investigation is look back at their social media to see if they can imply an intent that goes beyond a, a flag that might be rolled up in a, a backpack that they're in possession of. So that's the danger. Good, thank you. And Keith, you gave us a little bit of this in other countries, but, um, but here, and, and you teach now. What, what are you gonna tell your students? <laughs> the, I've already we want the out, preview. <laughs> I've already sent out a note to the students saying we continue unabated. Um, with our journalistic mission, which is to teach the international best standard practices of journalism, and, and with the University of Hong Kong's mission, which is academic freedom, um, but I guess the caveat after that is until somebody tells me otherwise. And I guess that's the whole point about press freedom and, and self-censorship you were talking about. I think the danger is not that we wouldn't continue doing what we do, uh, but that we would kind of pull back because we're afraid of going up to that red line or crossing the red line where you know, I, I prefer, as Anthony mentioned, you know, let's have some cases to see where the red lines are. Now, the danger with that is they're never gonna spell out where the red lines are. If we look at what happens in mainland China as a template or even in some of the Southeast Asian countries, they never wanna specify, you can say this, but you can't say that, uh, because they wanna have the flexibility. And so they're never gonna spell out the red line. So the, the trick, and again, if you look at mainland China, they're still, even with all the strictures they have there, you still have Southern Weekend, you still have Six Tone, you still have Kai Shen, you still have the New York Times doing that excellent Xinjiang reporting. So people kind of push the envelope to the red line. So you gotta know, and again, as Anthony said, everybody has to make that own decision for themselves when how, how much of a chance they are going to take. And you know, having been the correspondent in mainland China, I could say anybody who tells you they don't self-censor in mainland China is not being honest with you. We all self-censored all the time because among other things, you have to say, hmm, I've got this really good story, but is it worth me writing that story uh, if it's not really that important because I might get kicked out or I might get called in for it? So you know, you kind of have to kind of navigate all the time how you phrase things, what stories you choose to write, what stories I would choose to say, you know, I'm gonna ignore that story because I think that's probably a little too sensitive and I've got, a big, I got bigger fish to fry. So you have to kind of always know how to navigate those red lines without knowing what the red lines are. And keep in mind, the red lines are gonna move. They're gonna change depending on who's around and who's not around. I was there in 2011, 2012, uh, when Bo Xi Lai was one of the uh, top, uh, top guys on the, on the, you know, in the party. He was you know, named to be on the standing committee of the Politburo. All of a sudden, he was on the outs, and we were writing all of these stories about Bo Xi Lai and corruption and murders of, because that became, the red line shifted. It was okay to write about that. So you have to kind of, it's sort of like a U.S. Supreme Court justice was once asked about pornography, and he said, you know, I don't know it. I, I'll know it when I see it. I can't define it, but I'll know it when I see it. And that's kind of how they look at the red lines. I mean, they'll figure out if you've gone over the overboard or over the top. And usually, and again, it's, it's, it's all a question mark. You won't get you won't get sent to prison right away for violating it, but you might get called in for tea and told you came up too close to the red line. And so that, that's the main thing you have to worry about is that, that call for tea. And they, you know, but they usually do give you another chance, you know, when they, if, especially because they don't, uh, the red line is movable. Thank you. Um, well, we've, I'm sure we have a lot of good questions, so we will uh, start taking questions. Um, if you could, when I, Call on you if you could state your name and your um, uh, affiliation if you have one. And this is again uh, is streaming live and will be uploaded. So um, these questions will remain for posterity. Um, so who would like to? Given all that, who wants to ask something? <laughs> <laughs> way, way to control the questions, uh, Eric. <laughs> Sorry, um, 
Sorry, I know I did the introductions. I'm not hogging the first question, but um, you know, if you look at media ethics, we talk about duty of care, right? What is the duty of care of a journalist in Hong Kong now to their contacts? We talk about journalists, but if somebody says something that could get them in trouble, you could report it. We're talking about self-censorship, but what advice, I mean, if somebody says something that you think, as a journalist, could get them in trouble, do you just report it anyway? Or do you say, I'm not gonna report this? Because this is something that never existed in Hong Kong before. It does exist in the mainland and elsewhere, as Keith said. So what's your advice? Um, so uh, maybe an example would be the offending slogan, yes? Um, so if you're reporting um, on an ongoing scenario or situation, you're reporting the news, this was said, this was done, this is happening right now. Today in court, a person is appearing, they're appearing on the basis of these particular words. My, my sense is that because you are not advocating, condoning, encouraging, or inciting any of those offenses, that would be safe territory. But that is, again, the traditional view. That is the view of the Hong Kong courts. Um, that is not necessarily Sorry. the view that Sharon, that's yeah. not the question. The question is, what's your, obli what's your responsibility towards your source? So if your source says something, right, that you think could be in breach of the law, do you report it or do you protect your source? And, don't, and this does happen. I mean, I'm sure Keith's done that in the past. Has not quoted say, somebody saying something. You as a journalist could say he just said it, but you have a duty of care. If you read ethics codes in Hong Kong University, translated into Chinese, the AFP, ethics code that I wrote, we have a duty of care to our sources, as Anthony said, to protect them in recordings, but if somebody said some slogan or whatever, not, you know, should our journalists report it anyway, or should you protect your source by not quoting them on what they said to protect them? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I, I, I think I would appreciate that duty as being a, a much higher threshold at present. Um, it's not the same as a duty that a lawyer might have not to reveal uh, information about their client if they've admitted or confessed. Um, but I think you know th this is going to be another area that's going to be very concerning for reporters and journalists because if you can't identify what the problematic portion is of someone's speech, do you then um, not report, right? So. The advice for the time being is if, if you see a, a kind of uh, a flag or a concern, if, so, if someone is saying something to you that is obviously potentially criminal, you should protect that individual. And there are other reasons you should protect them. They might not be aware of the law. They might not be aware of the implications of the law. It could even be a source, as we now know, that um, overseas, right? You know that th this, this is a, a global jurisdiction for, th for this offense. So you could be talking to someone in the US who makes this comment to you. If you don't explain to them clearly that you know, potentially on their next visit to Hong Kong, they will either be denied entry or uh, you know, otherwise dealt with, then, then I think you have a duty to explain that, especially to people who are not in Hong Kong. I think the Hong Kong audience and uh, Hong Kong people are very, very savvy and very interested in the implications of this law, but that is something that I would be concerned about for, in particular, um, individuals internationally who don't understand how long the arm is of this law. Thank you. I think that was a really good point about the, um, the, the wide uh, reach of the law, too. Uh, Doug. Thanks, Jody. Uh, Douglas Wong, I'm a recovering journalist. Uh, when you, when Keith talked about the comparative situation and about how other countries have, um, in Asia in particular, have very bad uh, press freedom uh, rules and laws. Um, I think, from what I've seen, the you, in operating foreign correspondents operating in all these countries have always, till now, had uh, the assistance of their governments. I'd like to ask the panel, with the national security law and its implications for press freedom in Hong Kong today, is, is the assistance of an American government or a British government or an Australian government with a national who's a foreign correspondent here who falls afoul of this law a blessing or a curse? Or, or, or how, how, does, how, how does that normal relationship that we're used to apply now in this new environment? Good question. Um, who wants to take that? Um, I, I'll take a, take a punt to start with. I, I think one thing that is very clear is that 
the the way that the relationship between the Chinese government and the government of your home country or, uh, affects people's status on the mainland now applies equally to Hong Kong. So whereas in Hong Kong we could sort of come and go and do what we want and feel that none of that had any bearing, if you are, for example, a Canadian citizen in Hong Kong now, you should feel that the same risks that might apply to you as a Canadian citizen in the mainland apply, apply in Hong Kong. So that the you carry with you now the the baggage of your government and how your government deals with China um, in Hong Kong in the same way that it, it, it that you do in the mainland. Um, that, that's sort of a, I think an important thing to remember. I'll just I'm sitting next to a Canadian here, so uh, but uh, no, it's a, it's a great question. Look, you know, I was I was banned from Indonesia for two years because I wrote something in a sloppy way. I didn't know where the red line was. I was a brand new reporter. I got back in because, among other things, the U.S. government, the State Department, was pushing to get me back in. And I got in because the then Vice President of the United States named Dan Quayle was taking a trip to Indonesia, and they said, get on the plane with him in Singapore and fly in with him because they're not going to turn you away if you've got a Washington Post correspondent on the Vice President's plane. So that's how I got back into Indonesia. <laughs> and I used that time to go around and figure out what I, what I, why I had been naughty. Um, I should because you're probably curious. I had written a story previously about, it was actually a positive story about Indonesia's economy booming. The last paragraph or so, I said General Suharto, comma, who took power in a coup in 1965, comma, you know, has presided over the country, blah, blah, blah. When I was caught, you know, because I got in with, with Vice President Dan Quayle, I used that as an excuse. So an Indonesian friend of mine set me up an appointment to see an intelligence officer who brought me a biography of General Suharto and he said he did not take power in a coup. He took power in an aborted communist coup. So he saved the country. And he made me read the book. So, but so ever since then, I would, I've never had a problem again. But I know there are certain ways you have to say and phrase things, et cetera. But in answer to your question, you know, I, I think you know, despite what we hear coming out of the White House about fake news and all that, I mean, from the talking to the consulate here and embassies around the world, I think diplomats who work in embassies are still committed to trying to do what they can to protect foreigners. I think the big danger, and my lawyers here can tell me that, the big danger is probably maybe for Hong Kong citizens who have do, two passports or if they've switched and got rid of their Hong Kong passport and picked up a foreign passport, the Chinese government might not see them as foreigners. If, 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 I think that might be the bigger danger. Yeah, absolutely. I think w one of the interesting things about the way the, the national security law is drafted is that sort of catches well, clearly it's been drafted to catch all sorts of specific examples of behavior that they saw over the course of the last 12 months that they wanted to catch and so on. But the way it also catches their attempts to police behavior abroad. And, and the example I think is classic is that um, Gui Minhai, a Swedish citizen in Thailand, um, under the new national security law, could be legitimately arrested in Thailand with the assistance of the Thai authorities and extradited to mainland China for not traffic offenses, but the offenses of incitement to subversion for his publishing activities in Hong Kong, notwithstanding he's a foreign citizen, notwithstanding he's outside Hong Kong, and that the framework provided by the national security law legitimizes exactly that kind of rendition. Um, so, yeah. Good question. Um, we have time for another few questions um, all the way in the back on the, on the veranda. Someone will bring you a microphone. Please identify yourself. Yeah, Jürgen Kracht, uh, businessman. My question is related to the economy, and in particular, what does this new law mean for uh, journalists if they report, for example, a state-owned company that's quoted on the Hong Kong stock market, and there are some issues that may not be right, be it corruption or suspicion of wrong financial data. How does that uh, law impact reporting, which we all need for our business, fair reporting on economic matters and corporate matters. Good question. Um, Sharon, do you have thoughts on that? It's, um, so we know that um, companies and media are, are targeted and specifically named by this law. Um, what we can't say again, unfortunately, with any certainty is um, you know, what amounts to a threat to national security. Uh, the scenario that you're talking about where you have wrong economic information, would that amount to um, uh, foreign interference depending on you know, which organization reported it? Uh, that's something that you know, maybe Beijing would interpret. That could be one of the scenarios that Hong Kong courts would not adjudicate on. That, that could be a scenario that might be 
um, you know, adjudicated in Beijing. So there, there, there isn't a precise response to that um, other than what we hope would happen is that um, you know, an issue of a warning or at least a correction, that there would be some type of um, um, ability for the reporter or the journalist to correct rather than to come at it with a sledgehammer. But I think as these events unfold, we will know with more certainty whether that e economic misreporting would amount to something that is perceived as a threat. Is it potentially captured by this law? Yes. Good, thank you. Um, time for another question or two in the back. Thank you. Um, I'm Giles Hewitt from AFP. Um, I, maybe this is a question for Sharon. Uh, I wondered if you could flesh out the anecdote you made about the, the old ugly judge. Um, the, the, if the law is, has a continental flavor, one hopes that it won't be imposed by a continental judiciary. And I just wondered how you felt, um, I think you were asked this question earlier though and moved on to something else, whether you're optimistic that the apparent inherent, probably intentional ambiguity of a lot of the language in, 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 the, in, the, in the document, in the, in the legislation, would not stand up to a rigorous, genuinely independent judiciary and, and, and what sense you're getting from, from, from the court process about how it's going to work when these court, uh, cases eventually come to come to trial? Um, I mean, apart from individuals who are obviously facing the threat of this law in Hong Kong right now, I think the second least enviable position to be in in Hong Kong is to be a judge at present. So uh, the magistrates now, I mean, there have been, a, there are a lot of indications of judicial, um, the interference with judicial independence. Anthony mentioned the issue on the presumption of bail, which has been removed, the right to silence. There are many fundamental rights in the trial process that are effectively um, removed from judicial scrutiny by this law. Um, the magistrates in Hong Kong are bound by precedent, so they are bound by the decisions of the Court of Final Appeal. So those decisions will be in favor of things like protecting sources um, and you know scrutiny applying a greater scrutiny to intent um, uh, and you know, the subjective intent of individuals accused of breaching this law. So you will find as a magistrate that you were bound by a CFA precedent decision um, and, um, and then may face, of course, the uncomfortable position of watching that decision move upward in the food chain through the judiciary and ultimately um, you know, we have, this law is, um, it will be interpreted by the NPCSC. The, this, this law prevails over the basic law, over the Hong Kong Bill of Rights Ordinance. Any inconsistencies, this law will prevail. So I, I think it's a very difficult time to be a judge in Hong Kong. I think that you might find yourself compromised. That you, you have a, you, in your judicial oath, you make a statement about judicial independence. And if you are to try to uphold the duties and the responsibilities of that oath, it will come in direct conflict with what I think the PRC ultimately wants the judiciary to uh, achieve or decide in terms of these cases. Um, well, we could go on all day, but we all have jobs to go back to. So. Um, Thank you all for attending, and thank you to our panelists for their thoughts and, uh, and um, their honesty in letting us know what they know and what they're not so sure of yet. So thank you all. I'm presenting gifts. Yeah, you probably know what this is. Oh. <laughs>